O Lord Jesus Christ, though we cannot perceive you with the human eye, we see you with the eye of faith. And what we behold by faith here in your word, one day we will behold by sight. So until that great moment is ours and realized, please speak to us by your spirit and your word. In your precious name we ask. Amen. Well, let's consider Acts chapter 1 this morning and what the ascension means for us. And I want to say it shows us two things. First of all, the ascension of God's Son shows you a marvellous picture of God before his church. And I hope you'll be deeply encouraged by that in your walk with the Lord. But not only does it show us an incredible image of God before the church, it shows us, well, maybe a very challenging image of the church before God. But don't worry, there's still, even there, even there, challenging though it is, it's encouraging. But before you see any of those images, the glory of God before the church, or the church before her God, We need to set our hearts right, and we need hearts of humble believers rather than what I would call critical experts. We might begin this morning by saying, there's no critical experts in here. You're okay. If you'd asked me three years ago, did I personally know any epidemiologists, I would have said no. I I know none. I had a friend once who went on to study virology, but apart from that, I I have never really met an epidemiologist to the best of my knowledge. Wind the clock till now. I never realised that many in my family were epidemiologists, or that many people in this town were epidemiologists, but they are, you know, because all of a sudden, Though I thought I didn't know any epidemiologists, I was bumping into people talking about variants, R numbers, and vaccine hesitancy. And I thought, my, my, how they've learned. Wow, how I was wrong. It transpires, I know many epidemiologists. Or do I just know critical experts? And then, of course, you're faced with Ukraine and the absolute massacre of people and their civilization. And now I think it's very easy to find experts in geopolitics and military analysts. Look at the Russian army. Oh dear, they say, what logistical problems the Russians have. And they have machinery and weaponry that's way out of date. And their morale is very, very low. Well, friends, if this is Russia with weaponry out of date, logistical problems, and low morale. I utterly shudder to think what they would look like if they had high morale, up-to-date weaponry, and no logistical problems. I guess they would be somewhere in Poland by now. Are they experts? Critical experts? Hmm. When it comes to the ascension, what are you saying there, Christian? What's the acceleration speed that he leaves the ground? What's the trajectory of ascension? Oh, I hear what I've got now, you see. Now we've got an expert in physics. When it came to a pandemic, we had epidemiologists. When it comes to a war in Ukraine, we've got military experts and geopoliticians. When it comes to the miracles, Now we've got physicists that want equations. You'll never see the glory of God if you want an equation for how the Lord Jesus transitions from time into eternity, from earth into glory. There's not an equation in the world that can articulate what's happening. Is he lifted up at a certain speed? Is he dematerializing? Is heaven and earth, time and eternity fusing together and he's moving between them like a doorway between two rooms? There's not an equation to explain the power 
of God's miracle. You want to see God before his church and his church before him? Don't be a critical expert. Just be a humble believer. And let's take the first point then. If we are humble believers, let's be encouraged with God before his church. Let's read verses 1 to 8. And with your fingers and thumbs, count as I read every time you hear a member of the Trinity being referred to. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day Jesus was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men, gave many convincing proofs he was alive, and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Three verses in, the entire trinity is now being alluded to. Note that, three verses, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all been mentioned. I'm about half a dozen in my count. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this instruction, don't leave Jerusalem, wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard, John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We're not at verse 6 yet. And the Trinity has been shown twice. We're not even at verse 6. They met together, they said, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the times and seasons of the Father, he says. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Again, the Trinity revealed by the time we hit verse 8 going to verse 9. What is the Trinity doing here? I counted it at least 18 references, depending on your English version. 18 references, Father, Son, Spirit, Spirit, Father, Spirit, Son, Son, Spirit, Father. There's no order to it. It just comes as a cascade. But what is the Trinity forming? And where have you seen that kind of interplay before? Well, if we're seeing the Trinity revealed as the Lord enters glory, if you are fast and turn to Luke 1 and get reading from verse 26, you'll see the exact same Trinity being revealed as the Son enters time. I don't want to use crass terms like the Trinity is revealed like this as the sun goes up and the Trinity is revealed like this when the sun comes down because we're not saying heaven is somehow up the way. But what you do see in Luke 1 from verse 26 onward is the exact same thing. The Trinity being used to create the earthly body of Jesus. And now the Trinity is being used to create another body, the body of the church. First time round in Luke 1, you're seeing the Trinity creating the earthly body of the Savior inside the Blessed Virgin. Now you're seeing the exact same Trinity creating another body, that body's us, you and me, the church. What does that tell you about the church? It tells you the church is no mere human institution. It tells you the church is divine creation. When the doomsayers say there'll be no Christian presence in Britain by 2032, by 2050, there'll be no Church of Scotland congregations, I say, well, there'll be far less Church of Scotland congregations, but there'll still be assemblies that meet with that title, Church of Scotland, because you're not dealing merely with an institution. We've got structure like institutions, but we're more than an institution. We're a divine creation, a creation that comes from the mind and the heart of the entire Trinity. And what did the Lord Jesus say in Matthew 16? Not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church that the Godhead creates. I do believe the church will be in a different form. All its glory and pomp and ceremony will be stripped. Not necessarily any bad thing. There might be nobody in the house of lords in funny clothes. 
Not necessarily a bad thing. The leaders of the land might not turn up to the General Assembly to get their pictures taken. Not necessarily a bad thing. The church will exist in some format and be confident of that. But equally, there's a, there's a second encouragement here of God before his church, not just that the church will be here, but a more personal uh, word of encouragement. Some of us look in the mirror, don't we, and we wonder, who's really for me? Bad conversations with humans around us, difficult situations at work. Some of us on Friday were speaking about drugs and alcohol. And we can think to ourselves, well, I've walked the road where I'm pretty sure there was nobody for me. And when I look in the mirror, I'm not even sure I'm for myself. Could end it. Make it go away. After all, there's nobody for me. Not even for myself. Ah, but if you know of a soul who thinks like that, or even if your thoughts have wandered down that road, you come to Acts chapter 1, the ascension of the Saviour. If you are the church, by faith, all of God is for you. You know? Not just uh, like 33.33% of God is for you and the rest is very angry and against you. Not that the Son of God is only a third of God. He's all of God. But all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is utterly committed to every person in here who by faith treasures Jesus Christ. It might be true that there are no humans who are for you, but if you're in here, I think most of us would be for you. But even if it were true that no human was for that troubled soul, that you know, even if it's a man in the mirror, you remind yourself, but all of God is for me. And he paid more than Paris Saint-Germain paid for Neymar. He paid more to bring you in here. He paid more to get you to come to that table. He paid a price that we cannot put a figure next to. So you be encouraged by that. Well, there's more than just encouragement for us when the Son of God ascends into glory. There's also a something of a challenge for the church. Let's go from 6 to 11, and you'll see two heartbreaking and whopping error. Okay, here's the first one. They met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, there's a very earthly consideration. I actually think they mean the geographical Israel, this land that David reigned in, this land that the prophets cried for, this land that Moses crossed the Red Sea to arrive at. Are we getting that back? And what does, what does the Lord Jesus say? Does he greet them with the cold shoulder and the silence? He gives them an answer. Not for you to know. The times and seasons of the Father. Just you know this. As my people, you will be baptized in the Spirit and you will have power to be my witnesses all over the world. And then you see the concentric circles expand. Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Everywhere you go. Well, there's the first mistake, and there's the correction offered. They must have received it well. After he was taken up, we hear, verse 9, they're looking up intently into heaven. And then the two men in white appear and do what? Ignore the disciples? They offer them a word of correction. Why are you standing here staring up there? Now, if the first mistake in verse 6 was a very earthly mistake, I think this verse shows a very heavenly one. Heavenly minded, but no earthly use. The first one is all earthly use with no heavenly mindedness. And again, 
from glory they are corrected. And they respond to the correction, we're told, in 12. They return to the city. They don't stay there. Now, just ponder this. If the church that knew directly the ministry of Jesus Christ, witnessed his pastoral counsel, was blessed by the outpouring of his miracles, heard his sermons, if they could be found in error, why do we have delusional bodies of Christians who think it's only the kirk that's heretical? Because our assembly's pure. Is it? You trade one problem for another when you join a Christian fellowship. There are no pure assemblies this side of glory, whether it's a general assembly of a national church or a small believing assembly in somebody's front room. The minute you've got people gathering in faith, you've got error. The sign of being abandoned by God is not whether the assembly has error, but it's whether the assembly no longer has correction. You see, verse 6, error. Verse 7, correction. Verse 10, error. Verse 11, correction. What does it look like when there's error with no correction? It looks like the end of Romans 1. If you read the end of Romans 1, there's error. Where's the correction? You hear these chilling words, and God gave them over to the error. He no longer spoke the word of correction. He left them to it. Has he done that with all of us? Is that where we are now? Well, surely not. Surely the voice of correction can still be heard. Doesn't mean that the voice of correction is always obeyed, but it's heard. And thus, God is still in, as Jacob would say, in this place. He's still in this place. Be encouraged. It is not the days of Ichabod the glory has not entirely departed. Not yet. And so, the ascension of the Son of God, rather than being something for critical experts in physics to toy over tea and coffee, becomes one of the most useful, urgent, comforting, challenging truths we have. We see a great image of God for his church, The entire trinity forming the body of the church. And that trinity forming your walk with him. Father, Son and Holy Spirit committed to you and me. How can we doubt our value when we hear that truth? But the challenging word for the church. It can be found in error then. And heartbreakingly it's found in error even now. And until the day he returns... As the closing words from the angels, there will be error weave through the truth, but praise God, we can still hear the voice of correction until that great day when we hear the words for ourselves. Well done, good and faithful servant. We'll have received our own ascension and our own resurrection into the glory of life. Eternal.